Hi, everyone, and welcome back. I am Brett Norton with Beyond Clean once again. I want to quickly thank our event sponsor, Asculap, and our event collaborators, First Case, First Case especially for the nursing credits, and also power supply on the supply chain side. What is available in your resource window? Uh, you can connect directly with our sponsor, Asculap, on LinkedIn. You're certainly welcome to check out our Beyond, latest Beyond the Tour episode featuring Asculap. And of course, you can follow Beyond Clean, First Case, and Power Supply on LinkedIn. We welcome you to do that if you already haven't done that. It'll just help you stay up to date on the latest content and educational events. Our speaker for this session is Dr. Peter Nickel. Dr. Nickel is the Medical Director of Surgical Services at American Family Children's Hospital. He also serves as the Chief Medical Officer for Beyond Clean, so part of our team. Dr. Nickel is a well-known healthcare leader, innovator, cell processing advocate, and entrepreneur. The presentation title for his session is Cutting Edge, Cutting Edge Sustainability, Exploring Opportunities from a Surgical Standpoint. Are you ready to explore the cutting edge of healthcare sustainability opportunities? Dr. Nickel joins us to present a unique outlook at sustainability from a surgeon's point of view. Point of view, excuse me. Get ready to discover new and innovative approaches to sustainability that you can incorporate into your healthcare facilities surgical workflows. Join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Nickel. Brad, thank you um, for that. Uh, I would say generous and uh, detailed and probably inaccurate uh, introduction. So I'm um, I'm Peter Nickel, and um, hang on, let me close this. And when I was asked to do this uh, by Hank, um, it dawned on me that um, I actually, in spite of being very interested in sterile processing for the last six plus years, I didn't really know a lot about sustainability other than the basic precepts. And um, uh, so this has been an exploration for me and a, and a, and a learning process. Um, and one of the things that I'm finding through this process is that uh, this is one of these areas where economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, which I'll talk about, um, probably are even more heavily linked than I would have imagined. And although I'm not going to get into this in too much detail, it has a lot to do with human sustainability. And I'm sure some of you know this, but uh, we have a major workforce crisis now in healthcare, which we saw coming as seven to 10 years down the road, particularly with nursing that there was going to be a, a gray wave or a silver wave where people started retiring. That was accelerated by the COVID pandemic. And we now are short, for example, 1 million nurses in this country, and that sh shortage is growing by 50,000 uh, positions a year. And uh, by the way, the birth rate in this country is going down it's uh, so there's not more bodies and um, we have to really start thinking not just about our environment um, meaning our external environment and trees and water and, and energy and carbon dioxide but we also have to start thinking about human beings so um, with that in mind I'm just going to give you a little bit about my background other than beyond clean um, I don't really have a whole lot to disclose I am a pediatric surgeon and I'm at the University of Wisconsin I've been here for over 15 years now and my journey into all this um, with Beyond Clean and with sterile processing began when I was on spring break uh, about th six years ago. It was March of uh, 2017. And I am a compulsive email checker and I was checking my email and found that uh, I received a series of emails from one of my orthopedic surgeons. I was, of course, and still am the medical director of surgical services at the American Family Children's Hospital, which is the University of Wisconsin Hospital. And my orthopedic surgeon for the third time in three weeks had bone fragments on his equipment, his surgical uh, tools, instruments, after they come out of sterile processing. And he's, he was a spine surgeon, and he was very upset about this. And there was this big hand-waving 
uh, email that went out from our chief medical officer, which if you know me, I'm pretty passionate and I respond pretty ferociously because I'm half Viking. And, um, and uh, there's this, anyway, hand-waving email about, we need to talk about patient safety. We talk about it's all gonna get better. And I'm, I, my response was, listen, if we're making airplanes and we had this problem, we'd shut down production until we figured out what the problem was. And that didn't really fall on sympathetic ears. So that's where my journey started. And it started by me going down and viewing sterile processing and being completely overwhelmed by how chaotic and disorganized the environment is that they've set up for these people to work in. And that led to a, a blog, which then led to a phone conversation with Justin and Hank, which then led to a series of uh, podcasts. Uh, and even my first- Now playing Apple Podcasts. Sorry. Sorry, there was a problem with Apple. I don't know why Siri is doing that. Um, it's not a problem. Sorry. Um, so it's anyway. okay, Peter. Okay. Got rid of that. Okay. So, so anyway, um, I believe I said in one of those first interviews that uh, we need to have a shift in terms of how we view people working in sterile processing, that they're actually healthcare workers because they are interacting with uh, the instruments that are going into the patients, which you can't be more intimate than that in healthcare. So anyway, um, after that nice interruption by Siri, um, the environment. So I didn't really, I've not given a lot of consideration to what the resources are that are required to run a sterile processing facility. But I have a wonderful manager uh, at UW named John Harper, who uh, loves this stuff and actually knows Justin and Hank. And so I had him do some digging for me. And this is not a complete analysis, but we got data, one week's worth of data uh, for two of our facilities, the University Hospital and then the East Madison Hospital, which is our newer hospital, where they primarily do um, uh, outpatient day surgeries and stuff like this, and a lot of orthopedic surgeries. So not not super, super uber complex cases, but you know, hip replacements, knee replacements, shoulder replacements, stuff where people go home the same day or the next day. And we acquired data from these two facilities on kilowatt usage and, and gallons of water used by sterilizing equipment over the course of the week, including steam generation. I don't have a complete rendering of um, all the kilowatts that were used or all the water that's used, but what we could get data on uh, from Steris were 11 vision washers, 11 steam sterilizers, four cart washers, one in a wave washer, and um, oh, 10 cabby washers. And again, my disclaimer here is that my numbers are probably low. Um, so starting with the carbon footprint from all this equipment, so this is not including heating the buildings, does not include lights um, or anything like that, or air conditioning. Um, the total amount that these two facilities, sterile processing facilities are consuming kilowatts per year is about 122,000 kilowatts, which translates into about 105,000 pounds of carbon dioxide generated per year, or about 2,800 pounds of carbon dioxide per OR per year. We have 37 ORs between these two facilities. Now, you're going to hear this number a lot. I love to use this number. There are 208,175 hospital-based ORs in the United States. And I think that, you know, we have a children's hospital, we have outpatient surgery, we have an adult hospital, and then we've got the East Madison Hospital. And, you know, we're doing GI procedures, we're doing a lot of outpatient surgery, we do a lot of, you know, in complex inpatient surgery. I think we have a fairly representative mixture of cases uh, that provides an adequate sampling for what is going on in those other 208,175 hospital-based ORs in the United States. So we used our pounds of CO2 per OR per year and multiplied that by 208,000 and wound up with, you know, over half a billion pounds of carbon dioxide being generated to, um, sorry about that, to, uh, you know, feed the machinery with electricity in order to clean our instruments and sterilize them. This comes out to 268,000 
metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. Now, you know, in the grand scheme of things, this probably isn't enormous, but consider that hospitals are the number seven contributor overall to car, uh, greenhouse gases, and and uh, the ORs are the economic driver of um, of the uh, of the hospitals. In fact, the ORs um, uh, put out per case somewhere between six and I think five hundred um, pounds of, of carbon dioxide per case. There've been there have been calculations around this. So this may not be the biggest portion of um, OR CO2 production, but it is, it is significant. Steam, so steam is very, really interesting. It's, it's very um, <laughs> energy consuming to generate. It's 880 kilojoules per kilogram of steam. So it's a kilogram of water that's been heated up. So one kilojoule is 0.277 watt hours and one kilogram of steam is 221.6 watt hours. So, you know, it doesn't take a lot to get to a kilowatt here. So looking at our steam consumption for our physical, or for our two physical locations um, requires about 251,000 kilowatts of energy per year. This generates 215,000 pounds of CO2 per year. And per OR, this breaks down to 5,800 pounds of CO2 per year. So you can see in aggregate, we're generating over three metric tons of carbon dioxide um, per OR per year at our facility. Again, if I, if I march out in overall, so this includes the, 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 the uh, supplying the energy and heating the steam. So steam alone, now we're talking about, you know, a billion pounds of, of uh, 1.2 billion pounds of carbon dioxide per year to process all the surgical instruments in our country uh, for those 208,000 ORs. And uh, this comes out to over half a million metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. So, uh, you know, in aggregate, my calculations were, were you know, and again, I'm low, but this is about 818,000, 820,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide per year just for steam and energy to sterilize our instruments. Now, then there's this, I found this, there isn't a lot, uh, if you type in sterile processing uh, that gets published in PubMed. I think the most recent time I looked was about two months ago and there were 180 um, publications if you typed in sterile processing to PubMed. Uh, I found this very interesting one though on carbon footprinting for de decontamination and packaging instruments. And this was um, out of the British Journal of Surgery. And it was the lowest, not surprisingly, if you have instruments that are in parts of sets or trays, but it's 66 to 77 grams of carbon per instrument to generate it in order to sterilize instruments. And this goes up two, threefold if you wrap these instruments. So one of the take home messages here is don't do individual wrapping, right? Um, because it's, it's uh, three times as much carbon dioxide generation. Now, another number I like to quote is, this is probably a low number, but there's an estimated 29 million, up to 51 million cases, surgical cases performed in the United States every year. Okay, and we, I did another calculation based on our own utilization of instruments. Our, um, we, we do about 33,000 operations a year between these various facilities on our campuses. And we process about 600 trays a day. So we average about 6.06 .06 trays per case and about 80 instruments per tray last year there are 257 elective OR days. So we can get a, you know, a, a number of instruments per case average. You multiply that by 29 million cases per year across the entirety of the United States. Again, I feel that our numbers are fairly representative of what's going on in the rest of the world. You're talking about 14 billion instruments a year that have to be reprocessed uh, in the United States for surgical procedures, 14 billion. So, uh, so the, if you take these numbers here and, and multiply the grams by um, uh, the total number of instruments that are being reprocessed, you end up with about uh, a million metric tons of carbon dioxide being generated per year uh, to re-sterilize instruments based on the British Journal of Surgery's calculations in that paper. And then lest we forget, there's also the carbon footprint of employees getting to work. So Beyond Clean was nice enough to um, lend me their email list a number of years ago, and we did an economic survey. And um, I got about 900 responses on this, 
the, um, from people in sterile processing across the country. And 90.3% of them commute to work by car. And the average round trip was 32 miles. And there are currently, a, latest numbers on Google two days ago, 49,205 people working in sterile processing. So you start multiplying out these numbers and a, a, a gallon of gasoline generates eight kilograms of carbon dioxide and the average of the fleet average MPG is 22.2 miles per gallon. You can see where these numbers lead. And, um, you know, there's 44,000 people comp commuting to work, traveling a million miles, 1.4 million miles a day, consuming 64,000 gallons of gas per day, 257 work days per year. We're talking about, you know, 16 million gallons of gas per year or another 146,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide just to get people to to work and back to do sterile processing. And, and when I talked to John Harper about these numbers, he has had some experience setting up you know, centralized sterile processing for entire cities. This is something you should, you know, fall, come into consideration when we're thinking about carbon footprint here, although it's not feasible for all facilities. Water is also very fascinating. Uh, this was, um, again, a learning curve for me. Um, our facilities between hot water, cold water, and steam utilize 4.5 million gallons of water a year, or 123,000 gallons per OR per year. The people in my city drink about 16 million gallons a year. There's 269,000 people in Madison, Wisconsin. So our still processing consumes 25% equivalent of what is consumed by people drinking water in my city. It's pretty impressive. Um, so in the entirety of the United States, if we march these numbers out again on a per OR basis, we're getting 28,175 ORs. We're talking about 25 billion gallons plus of water or enough to drain this lake, Lake Monona, which is in my city, it's the uh, southeastern lake and Madison sits on an isthmus, it would drain Lake Monona in one year. Or if we give it six years, we drain both lakes around my city, Lake Mendota and Lake Monona. So it's a lot of water consumption. There are other aspects to sustainability um, I like to focus on. So, so, you know, the obvious thing here is throughput, right? If you have 14, 0.22 billion instruments going through sterile processing. I think everybody knows this who works in the ORs is there's a lot of stuff that doesn't get used. There's a lot of waste, right? So, you know, if you can eliminate unused instruments from trays, you solve your problem, right? You just need to collect data and then you have to convince the surgeons and then presto bingo alakazam, what could possibly go wrong with this strategy? In fact, this was a strategy that was proposed by our Green Council, um, uh, which uh, is supposed to be overseeing sustainability throughout our institution, and they proposed this. Let's get the surgeons together and get them to agree to what they need to take off the trays. And, and that's actually difficult um, because everybody has different ergonomics and different ways of doing things they're comfortable with. And then there's a lot of ego, and, and there's always a backfire of effect when you present people with data. Um, and, and honestly, the surgeons probably don't know. And the reason I say this is that we've spoken with some of the techs um, about this, and some of them just start taking stuff off the trays themselves, and they never tell the surgeons. <laughs> so I don't know if they're always aware of what they're using. But um, what could go wrong with doing this? Well, if you go about this in a... Um, in a data-driven way, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong um, if you're using human beings to collect this data. Uh, so data collection, data entry, data formatting, data extraction, data analysis, data interpretation. It's pretty complex stuff. So we blew past all of that, and I did the study anyway. Um, you know, and I think sometimes you, you learn a great deal from your hubris. But uh, our goal was to identify unused instruments from trays for our most common cases um, at the East Madison Hospital and the University Hospital and at the Children's Hospital and determine if we can reduce the number of instruments in the trays. So I had 24 observers who were all undergrads trained up to go in and gather data and talk to the staff and get count sheets and then put this stuff into spreadsheets. And they worked for seven weeks on this and 20 hours um, 20 hours per week doing four hour shifts. And our goal was to observe 
1,200 cases, which is not the majority of the cases, but we focused on the ones that we had, that were occurring at the greatest number over the seven week period. And in essence, of those 1,200 cases, we had partial or complete data on about 200 cases, which is very disappointing. And only five types of operations really met criteria for any kind of analysis, meaning, you know, I only had I, I, total hips, we got enough total hips, enough total knees, enough thyroids, enough parathyroids, and I think there was enough ear tubes were the five types of cases where we could generate some meaningful numeric comparisons in terms of what sur different surgeons are doing and what instruments are never being used. But there were challenges with data input, data retrieval, and lack of NN, and, and NN formatting. And it was, it was just a complete slog. And a very good friend of mine who used to be the um, CMO at, um, at Nestle Health warned me about this uh, several years prior. And he just said, look, when you put in data, okay, like into the electronic medical, medical record, even that data is formatted. It's not formatted for extraction. And so it takes 21 times the human effort, 21 nurses to extract the data that was put in by one nurse. And he knows this because he ran a study down at Geisinger in Pennsylvania. So data input and data output actually need to be formatted for extraction analysis. And, and you need to know what you're going to be looking for if you're going to put it in. And so if you're going to collect data on what instruments are being used, you have to have a very easily extractable format that you put it in in order to get the data out. And that's what we've been struggling with for the last year on this study. So when it comes to data collection in general, we're not very good, we stink. Um, but there were some really beautiful pearls that came through. So this is total hip arthroplasties. And this is from one of the trays. And this is, this is one of the orthopedic surgeons. And you see these clusters of numbers that all look the same, okay? So, um, so we think what drives instrument behavior, each of these clusters is a, very, is a very tight pattern of instrument utilization where stuff either is getting used or is not getting used, okay? And so we gathered up all the operations this guy did and we found there were essentially one, two, three, four different patterns and th two of these, you know, we had enough iterations, five and four, to run some statistical analysis on standard deviations and stuff like that. But he essentially had four different patterns. Now, what I still don't know <laughs> is was this, these numbers here, the number of times the instrument was used, this clamp Kelly curved, or was this the number of copies that this is of this instrument that were used during the case? And that, that piece of information is very, very important because it totally affects your interpretation of the data. And if you talk to the surgeons, they'll tell you, it's the number of times they use the instruments, not the number of copies. But we actually don't know. So there's two interpretations to this data. So this and three other surgeons had a bunch of interesting patterns, right? So we had problems with data collection, data entry right from the outset. And um, so if, it, if, the, if the data we're seeing is of the number of copies of these instruments that were used on these trays, and this is the same kind of data, we got similar patterns with parathyroidectomies, thyroidectomies, ear tubes, and uh, uh, knee scopes, okay? There were three orthopedic surgeons that were doing total hips. This is the first surgeon I showed you, he's in blue. He had four different patterns, which I showed you, okay? There were five iterations of this pattern, four iterations here, two iterations here, and one here. Then we have surgeon two in orange, he had three different patterns. And then we have surgeon number three, who also had three different patterns. The surgeons probably aren't even aware that they do this. This is probably subconscious. They have different unique patterns of utilization. Um, so if the data is that it's the number of instruments, copies of instruments were used, they're using about 52% instruments on the trace. Not too bad. If you talk to the surgeons about this, they're like, no, I'm using like eight to 12 instruments, maybe 15 max for most of my cases. If you talk to your techs, they'll tell you the same thing. So, uh, we go through all this rigmarole just to say, can we remove stuff that none of these guys use? Well, it turns out there are about eight instruments that they never use for this case. And if I take that off our trays, okay, and then I look at the instrument patterns and I produce their trays by 52%, now the instrument utilization is up to 59%. And, um, and then if I make a tray just for each surgeon that enables that surgeon to do any of his patterns, so I have a tray that allows surgeon one to do all four of his patterns. So he's going to have, have you know, a certain number of instruments. 
30, 32 to 38 instruments. I do this for all the surgeons. So they all have a unique tray for them that allows them to do any of their patterns. Okay. So I have three distinct types of trays now. The average utilization goes way up. It goes up to 76%. We're down to going from a 60 instrument tray down to a 32 to 38 instrument tray. Now, if I start inputting what I think is patient data that's driving these individual patterns, and I make trays for these surgeons for each type of patient they operate on. So they have a pattern-specific tray for each type of patient. We, we know what the patient's coming, and they, they, they're going to have these unique clinical features, and we know these clinical features are associated with a specific instrument of pattern of behavior, and I make trays just for that. Now we're up to, we, we have trays that range from 21 to 38 instruments, but we're getting to 94% utilization. There's, we're getting rid of a lot of waste. Remember, you know, it's 66 to 77 grams of carbon dioxide per instrument that we're reprocessing, okay? And it's about a buck 56 an instrument to reprocess. Again, you're seeing integration now between economic sustainability and environmental sustainability. So interpretation two, which is the one I prefer, after talking to surgeons, is this is the time number of times an instrument is used. And so on a 60 instrument tray, these guys are really prob probably only using 25 to 29 percent of the instruments. Uh, in some cases, they're using less than that. Okay. So, I mean, you know, 20 percent of 60 is 12. This is what they're telling us, right? So there you go 12, 12, 12. This is what the surgeon's saying. Yeah, I only use 10, 12 instruments. Now, if I get rid of the eight instruments they never use, okay, I'm up to 34% utilization. But this is where the magic really kicks in now. If I, you see how tight these patterns now become, right? If I make trays for them that will enable each surgeon to do any of their own patterns, so surgeon-specific trays without patient variables, now I'm down to trays that are 22 to 25 instruments, and I'm up to 73% utilization. And if I want to go higher than this, we'll get up to 95% utilization and we'll be down to you know trays with 12 to to 18 instruments per tray. We could get rid of 70% of the stuff on the trays. Okay. So which interpretation is right? I don't know. But the, the theoretical savings here. So you want to talk about economic sustainability. You know we do 600 trays of reprocessing every day at University Hospital. 80 instruments per tray, buck 56 per instrument, 257 elective OR days. If I could do this for every single operation, get rid of the stuff that's never being used, and well, let's assume it's 10 to 13 percent of the instruments are never used, um, I would save about 2.5 million dollars in reprocessing instruments every year. And if I start making surgeon specific trays under the interpretation number one, that's the number of copies of the instruments that are being used that were recorded in our data, then I'm getting you know a 24 percent uh, reduction in number of instruments across the system we're using. This is 4.62 million dollars in, in, in savings realized. And then if I start making pattern specific trays for these surgeons uh, based on my data, uh, we're saving them, you know, we're saving the, the institution 50% uh, reprocessing. So you start seeing your carbon footprint coming down and $9.2 million uh, in, in, in costs every year. So the theoretical potential, is potential savings in version number two where it's the number is the number of times the instruments used, not the number of copies. Again, marching out our numbers, 13% is 2.5 million. But if you just start doing surgeon specific trays, you're saving $11 million a year, $11.5 million a year. Well, you know, when I, I take our number of ORs and you know divide by the number of ORs and multiply the total number of ORs in the United States, we're talking about $64 billion of savings in the United States per year on sterile processing. So this is not a small number, right? And uh, in which interpretation is correct, I don't know. But uh, I, I do think that the, the data points in either interpretation towards we need to reduce the number of instruments on the trace. So the problem with this is, you know, I did this with undergraduates, okay? And so they, they volunteered. If I wanted to do this across the United States for one year and I had to get a reasonable professional workforce, I'm paying 25 bucks an hour at least to stick people in ORs to do these observations and gather this data, assuming that people are going to cooperate with them, like the nurses and the surgical techs and the surgeons, assuming they're going to be allowed into the OR in spite of the increased infectious risk. If we did all cases, all ORs for one year, paying observers, one observer per OR, $25 an hour, and have them during elective hours, 
for those 208,000 ORs, those 257 OR, uh, elective OR days, 9.3 hours per day, $25 an hour, you're talking $12.4 billion a year to conduct this study. Okay. Now remember, we only got data, uh, really usable data, about 9% of the cases. So the, using humans is not a great way to go here. But your cost per instrument, because there's 14 billion plus instruments, um, you know, per year, you're talking about your cost of doing this study per instrument is $87 per instrument. And the problem with this data is the data stops being relevant the minute you're done collecting the data because people start moving in and out of the healthcare systems. You have new surgeons coming in who do things differently, new technologies, new complexities to the cases, new patient types, and you have people retiring. So the, this is a very dynamic environment. So you stop your data collection. So there is a shelf life on this data and then it becomes irrelevant. It seems very expensive to do to me, at least with humans. So we are prohibitively expensive. So takeaway are, from this is that human data collection is onerous and erroneous and costly as is curation analysis. And yeah, we would, we would benefit from technologies that could do this stuff, this data collection for us, as opposed to putting additional people into the, into the OR and creating additional work and risk. So ultimately, visualization technologies and AI informatics are gonna be critical if we're going to get to sustainability and making ORs more efficient around instrument utilization and reducing our carbon footprint. But if we get there, what's this gonna look like? You know, the only thing human beings should be doing here is data interpretation and, and design of the study, and that's really it. But what if we could achieve an, a 70% reduction in instrument utilization, okay? What would our carbon footprint look like? Well, we'd go from, you know, 2,800 pounds of CO2 per OR per year uh, for electricity and 268,000 um, uh, metric tons of carbon dioxide per year to, you know, 852 pounds per OR per year and 80,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. And, and you see a similar shift with steam, right? You go from 5,800 pounds per OR and 550,000 uh, nationally metric tons of carbon dioxide, you, these numbers have dropped precipitously, 1,700 pounds per OR per year and 165,000 uh, metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. So not insignificant. Water, you know, so your aggregate um, CO2 production would drop down to 245,000 from 820,000 um, metric tons per year. And your water consumption will also drop by uh, Assume, presumably 70%. Um, so I wouldn't be, I, it would take me now four years to dra drain Lake Monona as opposed to one year. Um, but fixing these problems is really not cheap or, and it's not easy. And I guess this is my, the point I'm gonna drive home here is that the hospitals are the number seven contributor to climate change. So, so business as usual is not cheap. Spending extra money to reprocess stuff you are not using has a significant financial impact and environmental impact. It's not cheap. Um, and so we could achieve this a carbon footprint water use reduction of 70% and cost avoidance savings of $64 billion a year. That's to me worth it. I mean, this is, this is significant savings. Um, so I'm going to leave time for questions. I know that um, Brett's going to have a few questions for me around human sustainability. Um, so why don't you go ahead, Brad, and start firing away. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thanks, Peter, Dr. Nickel. Um, a lot of really good data points in that uh, presentation. I think one of the things that really stood out was the human factor, right? You know, I think we're all creatures of habit, uh, surgeons especially. So it's, it's not a turnkey approach on how they're going to, how we're going to sh make a major shift. Um, you know, there's, like you said, there's new surgeons, there's new procedures, there's new technology. Um, so, you know, in terms of the human factor and looking at the overall operations, you know, can you elaborate on yeah. what a surgeon or surgical surgical team can do to support sustainability and you know move in that direction. Well, I think some of this has to be grassroots. I think some of this has to be top down. An institution's leadership has to make a commitment. A CEO has to put it out and saying we are going to do this. And and there is a um, 
I mean, I can talk for hours about this, but there is a real lack of understanding of efficiency in, 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 uh, in how we are trained as healthcare providers. So a, a good example is I have a project going on with one of my DMP students right now around discharges. And we have new interns starting in a week. And so the, the pediatricians um, who are helping her with this study are like, well, you know, once July rolls around, um, you know, our ability to get discharges out falls apart because we have new interns. And I'm like, well, why does that have to be the case? Why are we not training people to be efficient in when they discharge uh, uh, patients? That should be a skill, right? So we don't train that. So you have to have that mindset in the training for starters. Two, you have to have courageous hospital leadership that says, we're not just going to pay lip service to this. We know this is a problem and we're going to start fixing this. We know the fix is going to take time. Number three, hospitals um, are not going to be able to do this themselves. You need relationships with industry. Um, academia is not going to do this. Academia is not built for this. Academia is built to publish papers. Sorry, it's true. I've been in academia for 20 years now. Um, but there also are some things you have to understand. And that is that um, there are some human factors that are now immutable, right? So like I said at the beginning, the birth rate is declining. The workforce is getting smaller. We actually have a Russia-China problem around this. We don't have more bodies coming. And in this country, unfortunately, the position of our unions, unions is throw more bodies at this. There are no more bodies to throw at this. So what we need to be talking about is how do we elevate the workspace, which is something I've been talking about with Hank and Justin for six years now. Like, how do we make the space better? Because you make the space better, you're not gonna have problems with retention. You, you, if you engage people on the ground so they can also help solve these problems, you're gonna get buy-in, okay? But right now, we're doing a study in the OR, just working at, looking at nurse workforce. And I am blown away by the error rates we're seeing with the simplest of tasks, because they are 10 to 50 times higher than you, what you expect for an equivalent task occurring in high-end manufacturing. And there's a lot of reasons for this, but it's a very chaotic, highly variable environment. And if we're gonna make healthcare more efficient, and this is where the human sustainability part of this becomes very important, you can't keep making human beings doing the work they're doing because we don't have the ability to improve our efficiencies. We are error prone. The more stress you put on us, the more areas you're gonna have. That's why I'm seeing error rates that are 10 to 50 times higher than you predict because of all the cognitive loading and all the stress, focusing on a patient, focusing on a surgeon, focusing on instruments, and then thinking about what you gotta do next downstairs to get something upstairs. We have to think about this and think about how we're gonna evolve the system so it's sustainable from a human point of view. And you know, this is one of the few areas we're gonna honestly say, well, human sustainability, economic sustainability, and environmental sustainability here are completely interdependent on each other. You cannot, fix one without addressing the other two. It's impossible. Right. Yeah, I very good point. Question. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, uh, it's a very well-rounded answer and there's no simple answer to that, you know, in terms of looking at the C-suite and, you know, the OR, as you know, is the driving uh, stream of revenue for hospitals. And so, turning that, you know, focusing on the sustainability piece when revenue is at the premium, you know, how do you implement both sides of the coin and, you know, really make sure that there is a shift in terms of saying, okay, we are going to save money by doing this, but we've got to do A, B, and C. Um, but like you said, it's, it's working with the human factor, at the, you know, on the front end. Well, I think, you know, if I, if I could change one thing in healthcare, I'd get rid of all the current leaders and I'd replace them with engineers who are, who've been engineers on the ground level, systems engineers, um, manufacturing engineers, who then rise up to run companies because they think about things and look at things through a manufacturing lens, okay? And right. healthcare needs to be organized like high-end manufacturing. And what high-end, you look at companies like Asculap, they've elevated the worker, right? They, they know that they, there are certain things a human being can do that is never gonna be replaced by AI or by machines, but there's a lot of things that humans do that are um, error prone. And you're putting other human beings at risk by enabling or allowing those people to continue to do those tasks. So 
one thing I've been working on is winning over my nurses by doing this study on workflows and you know educating them on the airways and saying this is not your fault. We know this is a problem. You have 300 tasking jobs you have to do in a flow of a single case. Who is going to be able to do all those correctly with all these other things going on? Like we actually need to get rid of the charting and bring AI to do this stuff for you so you can focus on the patient. We need to do, we have the absolutely same kind of shift going on in sterile processing in terms of how instruments get inspected, in terms of how they get sorted and identified. And then, you know, I see this Bobby, Bobby Parker asking a lot of questions about this. Um, you know, getting a surgeon by and saying, this is your data. We're gonna build trays just for you to meet your needs. So we'll get rid of unnecessary variability, but we are not gonna make you be like everybody else. That's what you have to do. Right. This is a big lift. But the bottom line is if we don't lift, you know, this is more than $64 billion a year and a ton of carbon dioxide that we're generating and a ton of water we're wasting if we don't address this issue. Yep, agreed. Well, why don't we get to a couple more questions here? Um, how does the current use of single use items in surgeries impact our environmental footprint? And are there any sustainable alternatives or strategies to reduce that impact? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I keep coming back to, if you can do intelligent tray reduction, so these surgeons are not aware of their patterns, but their surgical techs totally know this stuff. They know exactly what they're gonna use. They know what they're not gonna use. If you can implement that strategy, then you know single-use wrapped items start going down. Okay, you'll you'll start. You share the data with them. You know, if, if you don't approach this like an aristocracy, you approach this like a democracy around information, and you give the, say well, this is our initiative, but we're going to give you the data. We're going to work yep. with you on this. You're going to get most people to buy in. They're going to go, yeah, I, I, and and not just share that data, but. You know, what we've done, like, for example, with on-time starts is everybody knows who the surgeons are that are late. We know who the high, the high performers are. That has a tremendous, and that, that's what implementing any kind of punishment, just letting people know what's going on. You know, pride and shame have a lot to do in, with regards to motivating people. Um, so you get those numbers out there, you be transparent, and you democratize that information, and people will start to behave in ways that are, you know, uh, beneficial. And, you know, I think then it becomes an issue for hospital leaders. If you have the occasional surgeon who does not want to agree, you say, look, you're a good person, you do good work, but you do not align with our values. It's time for you to go somewhere else. That's leadership. Those are hard decisions, right. but that's leadership, right? Yep. And that's after you're exhausted, let's work with you around this to try and figure this out. But you have the, I mean, you know, I knew a surgeon who would deliberately do cases in, 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 a, in a way that, drove up the number of consumables he was using just to be obstinate. That's where leadership has come and say, you know what, that's not okay. If you can't stop doing that, you're gonna have to go work somewhere else. We're not gonna renew your contract because everybody else here is leaning into this problem. Right, yeah. And you know, uh, to follow up on that, I know that there are a number of surgeons out there that they, they're very particular when it comes to having the availability of those of a specific instrument. And they, it may just be a one-off or just they want it there just in case. So you're, ba you're saying that having that, those data points and saying you're not using these. And, Absolutely. and <laughs> throughout all of these cases, the last two, three months in these total hips, you've not used this instrument once. Right. And so I would think that having that concrete data is a really good way to transform that behavior. So... Well, and you, you aren't necessarily getting rid of the instrument in the fleet, okay? Right, you may it's be there. Keeping it on the yep. side, right? But if, you know, okay, so let's say that happens once every two years and somebody's got a break from the LR and now you got a 10 minute delay in the LR to go get that one instrument every two years. Okay, well, a 10 minute delay is $1,500, okay? But not reprocessing that instrument, I can guarantee you over two years, probably, probably, and all the other instruments are not there, probably more than compensates for that one time in chargeable minutes that you lost. Right, yep. Um, all right, so let, let me get to another question here. I'll filter through some of these. Um, what are some of the drawbacks or obstacles you see to optimizing surgeons trays and removing the unused instruments? Yeah, so, so I think that the 
it's cultural, right? So I, I think that the, the, the on the tech level, the surgical techs are going to either protect their surgeons or they'll get defensive because they've already done some sort of instrument reduction. And so they feel like they're getting, you know, passed over. Um, so I think you have to have buy-in, uh, particularly from surgical techs. I, again, I think motivating the surgeons is very important. Um, I am, as opposed to the Harvard Business Review, I'm not opposed to you know, economic incentives or sanctions. Um, we've certainly seen that work in terms of getting people to sign their notes on time and do their billing on time. Um, and the surgeons can probably afford it. Um, but I think you're gonna run into, uh, until you can convince people that you don't need all this stuff and we can make your life better and start showing them the data how it makes their life better, it's gonna take time. This is not gonna be, you flip the switch one day and this suddenly works. It is gonna require um, change management for sure. Right. And, you know, uh, well, and then, and then I, I would tell you, you know, once you start doing this, there's got to be buy in also um, from sterile processing because you're going to have to reconfigure sterile processing a fair amount. Um, uh, you're going to have to probably change the, what, what's in the fleet. Um, you're going to have to take out stuff you don't need. There's going to be some stuff you're going to need more of. And you're going to have to really kind of tune the workspace in SPD uh, so it's better for the employees down there so they can they can manage um, the higher flow of instruments. Because what, what you're moving towards is opening up OR capacities with this kind of stuff. Right. And it's going to vary by facility, right? There's, you know, certain facilities are doing more ortho cases. There's labor and delivery cases. There's, you know, um, so I think the educational piece that we all always focus on in training the sterile processing text to understand the level of complexity that the surgeons are dealing with, and then vice versa. Uh, there, there needs to be some correlation between the departments and working together. Well, I would go, I'll go more in correlation. I, I think there has to be integration. And yeah. you know, when I gave my first talk in SL Stanford back in 2018, Hang and Justin invited me to do that. Uh, I talked about walking the deck on the carrier, right? So you need people to view it as an integrated system. They have to be partners in this. And I'm not, and I'm not trying to like give everybody a hug and sing kumbaya, okay? Right. There's gonna be a lot of uncomfortable discussions in doing that. And, and there's gonna be frustrations also, all these other things that come with being human, right? It's not gonna be some happy powwow, but you've got to break down these barriers and start seeing this as all part of one ecosystem. And, right. and stop looking at this as towers. You know, there's not an upstairs and a downstairs. This is all one it's unit. one unit, yep. Right, absolutely. So that has to change. Right, And, yep. and you're gonna to have to get input as you're making improvements in these processes of where you're succeeding, where you're failing. And right. you only get that from people in the trenches, in all the trenches. Yep. Yeah, and as you mentioned, you know, take uh, taking out instruments from trays without, you know, collaborating or working or integrating with the surgical team is maybe a good idea from an efficiency standpoint, but not necessarily in terms of, you know, relations across departments. Right. Um, here's another one. You touched on the use of AI to get some yeah. of this da data. Um, have you seen any solutions or technologies out there that an OR could implement today to begin collecting some of that usage data without such heavy human involvement? So the, we're, at, we're working with Layer Job right now um, on yep. this. I've got, uh, Esri College Nursing has been very, very good to me. I've got free unfettered access to their Sim Center. And I've got a couple of kids who are uh, with engineering backgrounds who are working with Layer Jot. They're very interested in um, Layer Jot in, in identifying instruments. And, and I'm, you know, it, it's kind of a heavy lift because you have to have the human input to begin with to teach the AI and that takes time. But we're also, Thing about this in terms of you know nurse charting like patient in the room patient out of the room incision time time out um time of time out um you know uh prep time uh type of prep uh you know what's a prep and i mean there's all kinds of stuff if you can teach the ai so it's not there yet um but it it does exist in some formats in other spaces there's a company down in illinois that manufactures motors for rockets and and they have ai that the instruments they use are very expensive and very precise, and they show up just like instrument trays, and uh, they're, they're, they're format cut to pop the instruments in there and takes a picture to make sure all the stuff's in there before it moves on, the instruments move on to another station. So these things are being implemented, but 
surgeries, obviously, we're talking about smaller, more complex um, sets of instruments, um, uh, not the best lighting, and having to have the right level of cameras to identify stuff. And then, you know, eventually you can identify instruments, then you start looking at inspection instruments and looking for bio burden and developing visual proxies for what's a reasonable, safe amount of bio burden if there is such a thing or what deposes no risk. So you can see where all this goes. The funny thing is, is that once you start implementing the AI and starts teaching itself, once we get over that hump and the instruments start going down, the process becomes much easier, right? Right. So, so there are not, to answer your question, there are, there are companies that are now working in this. Layer is the most advanced that I've seen, but they don't have a solution they can stand up right now. And we're working with them on that. Right. And then it goes back to the human factor again and actually trusting that the technology is working. Right. So there's, you know, there's a little bit of a wall there when it comes to that, not knowing whether or not to trust it or work with it. So, um, you know, but that's that comes with time and implementation and repetition. Um, can you give us an example of what it looks like to build trays based upon patient profiles? And, you know, how does a facility go about doing that? And how does SPD know which tray to pull for the R? Yeah, so nobody's doing that right now. Um, the first thing I would do is I get rid of what's not being used. I would, I would do this in iterations. And then the second thing I do is build surgeon specific, specific trays um, because the surgeon specific trays don't require you to have any kind of uh, electronic medical health information. Once you cross over and, and you know, based on what we've seen, you're gonna get a very high return for just building surgeon specific trays. Once you start getting pattern utilization, then you need EMR and um, you need a lot of iterations of EMR. So it isn't something you're gonna do right away. Um, but what I would imagine is you're gonna, you're gonna have to have a system that's a little bit more just in time and you have a massive inventory which is building, you're pulling instruments out and building your trays the night before, or maybe even a couple of days before. I mean, cause we know these cases are getting booked, elective cases are getting booked, you know, two weeks in advance. So, um, and then the question is, you know, do you, just, you know, you're going to be using fewer instruments and to make, take, make better, take better care of your instruments. Do you have some sort of mold, reusable mold that you can print into to put the instruments in before you sterilize and send them up, you know, uh, and then flatten the mold out and start all over again? I mean, that's what I imagine it would look like, but, you know, we're years away from that. But that's where we need to go. Right. Yep. Um we got a good question here from Michelle. Uh, her facility in Las Vegas reprocesses trays, wrapped items, peel packs based on the manufacturer IFU. The shelf life on the packaging container being event related is not an option. So any suggestions or ideas to reduce the impact of reprocessing sterile items that the, con that the container of packaging uh, wrap is about to expire? Oh, uh, yeah, you know, this is a great question. So, IFUs are legal documents. They're not scientific documents. So there was a wonderful article I read three, four years ago, maybe now. And I think it was out of Stanford or UCSF where they looked at IV bags. Um, and the uh, American Society of Anesthesia and uh, actually CMS say, you know, once you spike an IV bag, it has to be thrown away after so many hours. So they they did a test where they they spiked a bunch of IV bags and stuck them in a closet and kept them there for weeks. And then they did, you know, um, RT-PCR looking for bacterial RNA and DNA. They couldn't find any, right? So, you know, I think this is one of these things where we actually need to be driven by scientific data, not by IFUs, right? And um, and and uh, and not by legal documents, because I totally agree with you. Uh, and this extends to disposables. I mean, we throw away one half of one percent of our disposables every month. Six percent of the stuff that we order gets thrown out every year in our mm -hmm. sterile core. That's incredibly wasteful, and a lot is just because it's out of date. Yep. But there's no evidence that it's not safe. And what do we do with it? Well, you know, we send it off to third world countries where it's used there. <laughs> right. right. So yeah. th those are legal documents. And I understand why those exist. 
but but the truth is you have much greater risk for infection just by people going going in and out of the room you know 98 percent of the airborne bacterial containing particles come from the skin in the or of the people moving through the or i just reviewed a paper on this so you know i think it needs to be driven by science that's really the answer and i don't know if the politicians or industry are going to like that but that's the truth there's a huge right. amount of work. yep yeah and i think um it's always the the money driven factor as well you know it's uh getting away from that thought process and uh, thinking in terms of the patient first and foremost and the efficiencies behind that. Um, you know, it's, it's a complex uh, problem and not an easy solution, but I think, you know, implementation over time is something that uh, is a very, very good point when we're looking at this as big picture. Um, in your conversations with other service uh, surgeons, what would you, would you say is the typical response to the request to optimize their sur surgical tray and begin removing those unused items? Uh, there's actually been a spectrum. So neurosurgery has been very interested in this for a, a long time, my department here. Um, they're very engaged around this. Orthopedics, zip, not interested at all. Um, my general surgeons are interested in it, but general surgery staff have not been as interested. So it's really been a spectrum. You know, you, you've got outliers on either end, truly. And I know I'm an outlier. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I've had surgeries, all, most of them orthopedic. My dad has had some, some orthopedic issues. And I do remember being in the room and the, and the surgeon saying, I don't know if I need these many trays, but I'm glad that they're here before I, you know, slipped off into a fog. So it's, it's, I think it's a safeguard, um, you know, for a lot of surgeons, just knowing that it's there. Um, but, you know. So, so Bobby Parker had an interesting question here. Do you find that the priorities of safety, operational efficiency, sustainability are in conflict with one another? Absolutely not. I do not. How do you balance those priorities when selecting products you prefer to use in the OR. So, um, you know, if, if, you, if you're talking about uh, disposables, um, again, I would say, so we, we went through this with appendectomies and we have, I have several outliers in my group who are very expensive when they do appendectomies. And then I got uh, several of us who are not. Um, it's hard to get convince people, particularly young surgeons, that they need to change. Um, but, you know, an institution can say, we're just not going to purchase this product anymore. You know, the other product has been evaluated and it's fine. If you don't like that, you can move on. Um, so uh, a good example is disposable ports, which I never use. There's a $12 disposable port, laparoscopic port, and there's a $225 disposable port. I never use a $225 disposable port if I'm ever in a situation where I need to use a disposable port. But I don't, I, I think that you, um, you know, as long as you're choosing stuff that is safe, um, I don't think there's really any, any conflicts there. I, I, sustainability, efficiency, safety, all this, and we're, what we're doing now is, is not sustainable on all those levels. So this is all integrated, and I don't find any of this being in conflict. Bobby actually has a lot of questions here. Yeah, uh, and I can uh, close us out. This this one um, is big picture. Um, what, you know, so crystal ball, what do you think the future holds for yeah. sustainability in the OR? Uh, well, okay, I didn't get into this, but we have a, about a trillion dollars in chargeable minutes in the OR that go begging every year national, nationally. Trillion. Huh. Um, if we are going to you know, capture 75% of those minutes, what it looks like is everything I've told you. We're going to have to start, in a, we're going to have to start making, taking high-end manufacturing principles and start applying them to healthcare. This has been done in sports. If you look at the game of hockey, it is, and I played hockey, my brother just won a Stanley Cup as the chief of player development for the Las Vegas Golden Knights. That game has evolved tremendously in the last 20 years because of informatics. And you got a bunch of people who said, oh, we don't do this, this is how we play hockey, right? Now everything, the technology, everything's evolved. This game, I, it's almost unrecognizable to me. If you can do that in hockey, or you can do that in soccer, 
if you start doing this in medicine, medicine, you start using informatics, you know, heat mapping, all this stuff, looking at tasks, cognitive loading, bringing in technologies that already exist. Medicine goes from being a very complex um, business, you know, and, you know, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Paradigm that nobody understands is something that looks a lot like everything else we do, mm -hmm. right? That's what it has to look like in the next 20 years. We, yeah. This is why I said we need more engineers as leaders. We need to bring in those high-end manufacturing principles so we can elevate the human and reduce the risk and the stress. That's right. what it has to look like. Yeah, and you may, it's a good analogy, I think, with hockey and the chaotic nature of that game and how fast it moves. Right. And the evolution with a fast game and using those specific tools to really grow the sport is is fascinating. And I think that that, can, that same perspective can be implemented in healthcare for sure. Right. Um, all right, well, Dr. Nickel, I think we've hit the hour. I appreciate it so much. Really good discussion, some great questions. Um, you know, a lot to think about, but you know, in terms of the right sizing and optimizing trays uh, going forward is, uh, is a good step. And I think a good way to think in terms of the overall uh, efficiencies and working together to implement change and uh, in the industry. So really appreciate all your insight. And Thank if you. anybody anybody out there has questions for Dr. Nickel directly, he's available on LinkedIn. Feel free to reach out to him. Uh, you're certainly welcome to throw some more questions in the Q&A and we will filter them his way. But Dr. Nickel, thanks again for joining us, my friend. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Always. And um, we're about, about 10 minutes out for the next session, so stick with us. We've got some great uh, education coming your way. And once again, thanks, everybody, for joining us.